We will now move on to First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think this is one of the achievements we are most proud of. This yard is iconic in Scotland. Those were Nicola Sturgeon's words in 2016 when talking about the contract to build ferries at Ferguson Marine. Does the First Minister accept she has made this yard iconic, but for all the wrong reasons? First Minister. Um, I still believe the Scottish Government was right uh, to do everything to save Ferguson's shipyard. Uh, but for uh, those decisions, of course, Ferguson Shipyard uh, would not still be open, not still employing significant numbers of people as it is today. So uh, Douglas Ross and I may well uh, take different views on this, but I do think it was right uh, for the Scottish Government to protect and save jobs uh, and protect that shipyard. Uh, as I set out in questions uh, last week, um, the delays to the timetable for the construction of these ferries and the cost overruns is a matter of deep regret. Uh, the Audit Scotland uh, report published last week set out uh, much of the detail of this, and the Scottish Government, CMAL, is certainly intent on learning uh, all lessons. Uh, but I do not regret the fact that Ferguson Shipyard is still operational and still employing lots of people. Douglas Ross. It is good that people continue to be employed. We welcome that. But not a single mention in the First Minister's answer about the island communities that have been waiting for years for these lifeline services. That is where the regret should be from this First Minister, but they do not even merit a mention. The deal that she is so proud of has become a disaster because we now know that the Government waived a crucial safeguard that would have protected taxpayers' money. International guidelines say that the refund guarantee is the financial cornerstone of a shipbuilding project. The guidelines state, and this is a direct quote, it is unlikely that any shipbuilding contract will be signed if there is no such guarantee. But that's exactly what this First Minister did, knowing the risks. Last week, when I asked about the guarantee, she said, and I quote, that decision was clearly taken based on a balance of risks. In other words, she dropped a vital safeguard standard for these types of contracts in order to cut a deal. Five years on, does the First Minister accept the risks were far too high and this was a bad deal? First Minister. Well, firstly, in my initial answer, I did express deep regret, I think those were my actual words, about the delay in the construction of the ferries and the cost overrun. And clearly those most impacted by the delay in the construction of the ferries are those who live in our islands. Uh, and that is where uh, the deep uh, regret uh, rightly uh, lies, my deep regret uh, li uh, rightly lies. In terms of uh, the wider question, uh, Obviously, in terms of the refund guarantee, I set this out in full last week. Uh, there, uh, of course, uh, was a failure on the part uh, of FMEL to offer the full refund guarantee. There were a number of steps taken, as I set out in detail last week, to mitigate the risk that was caused by that. I set out the three key uh, steps in mitigation that were taken. Firstly, uh, changes to the final payment uh, that was to be made to FML for delivery of the vessels was increased from 15 per cent to 25 per cent of the contract price, uh, effectively CMAL, therefore withholding more of the payment until uh, the later stage. Secondly, CMAL to take ownership of all equipment, machinery and materials as they arrived at the shipyard. Uh, and then thirdly, FMEL would require all major suppliers to offer the full refund guarantee with CMAL as the payee. So those were the steps in mitigation that were taken. Um, and then uh, there was a requirement uh, for ministers to take a, a decision on a balance of judgment. And as the paperwork actually that has been in the public domain now for some time, makes clear uh, the view of CMAL. CMAL, uh, of course, uh, did articulate concerns about this, and that is all laid out uh, in the paperwork and in the Audit Scotland report. But there was also a view uh, that the negotiations with FMEL had led to the, the best deal that was capable of being struck uh, with FMEL. Now, had that decision not been taken, and I, I express again my deep, deep regret at the delays in the cost overrun and the construction of these uh, ferries and lessons uh, are being learned, have been learned uh, and will be learned. 
Uh, but I do not regret the fact uh, that that shipyard still exists, that that shipyard is now employing, I think, more than uh, 400 uh, people. Uh, and as well as learning lessons from this experience, uh, we are also determined to ensure that that shipyard has a bright future. Douglas Ross. The, the, First Minister, the First Minister stands there and says lessons have been learned. Yet the Audit Scotland report from last week said there is no evidence that the Scottish Government, Transport Scotland or CMAL conducted a formal project review exercise after the original contract failed. That is how you learn lessons, yet her government, government did not do it. And she could not, despite a very long answer there, accept that this was a bad deal. But she did mention CMAL and their uh, public uh, statements, both uh, in the public domain and in the Audit Scotland report. Well, they know this is a bad deal because they have said, and let's remember, this is a company owned by the Scottish Government. They said they would not agree another contract with those conditions. A government-owned company is saying that. Do you know what else they said in the Audit Scotland report? Regardless of what Scottish Government ministers tell them, they are so opposed to this deal, they can see the pitfalls, even if her government and her ministers told them they would not do that. They get how bad this deal is. The First Minister does not. And it is important to islanders and island communities. These ferries are vital for their way of life and work. So let us look at what happened here. Nicola Sturgeon signed off a contract against the advice of experts. She started building ferries without agreeing a design. She threw good money after bad, and a quarter of a billion pounds has been spent with nothing to show for it. And worst of all, the person with the ultimate responsibility, the First Minister, removed the essential safeguard that would have protected Scottish taxpayers. A former Scottish Government shipbuilding adviser says the final cost could rise to between £350 and £400 million. Pounds. First Minister, can you guarantee to Scottish taxpayers that will not be the final bill? First Minister. The Chief Executive of the Shipyard and uh, CMAL, as I understand it, and this is significant because this is, uh, I think, the first time that this has happened, have endorsed uh, the latest cost estimates uh, which the Finance Secretary set out to the Chamber uh, last week uh, and the latest updated uh, timescale. Uh, these are the cost estimates and all of the efforts of those uh, in the yard uh, are now ensuring uh, that these ferries are uh, delivered. Uh, Douglas Ross says, and you know, firstly, presiding officer, I am not standing here and saying that there is not a great deal to deeply regret um, about the conduct uh, of this uh, contract. Uh, that is clearly the case, uh, that this has not gone uh, the way anybody would have wanted. Uh, but Douglas Ross says there is nothing to show for it. There are, as of uh, I think the uh, middle of uh, March this year, 462 people in Ferguson Shipyard that have employment. I think that is something to show for the actions of this government. Um, and we will now go on with learning the lessons. Douglas Ross says no lessons have been learned. And then, of course, then of course he narrates uh, the lessons that CMAL have already uh, learned and are putting into practice. So we will continue to learn the lessons. Uh, and most importantly, we will continue to focus uh, on completing the ferries, which is the most important thing for our island communities. Uh, and we will also focus on making sure that Ferguson Shipyard and all those who work there now and in the future have that bright future that I think people across Scotland want. Thank you, Ross. I know the First Minister does not like First Minister's questions because people you know, hold her to account and seek answers, but not even an attempt to give a guarantee that a former Scottish Government adviser says this will go to £350 to £400 million. Pounds. Nothing from the First Minister to say in her answer that she would guarantee Scottish taxpayers that will not happen. What should have been, in the First Minister's own words, a proud achievement have, has become a sign of this Government's incompetence. The Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, said in 2014 the SNP would replace 12 ferries with £250 million. They have not even built one for that amount of money. They have ignored the experts, and islanders remain stuck with a rotten ferry service with no sign of improvements. Her government struck a deal on the balance of risks that has been catastrophic for Scottish taxpayers. And any evidence as to why this call was made has mysteriously vanished. Audit Scotland could not find a shred of evidence. It is in their report. Nicholas Sturgeon's whole claim here 
even after she's lost £250 million without building a single ferry, is that the deal was the best option available? First Minister, are you seriously saying that you would sign the same deal all over again? First Minister. Firstly, that was the view at the time the contract was signed. Um, obviously, we would uh, not repeat what has happened. I think that is self-evident. Uh, on the issue of the costs, Douglas Ross has quoted, and I know he's quoting somebody else, uh, costs of uh, between 350 and 400 million. I simply don't recognise uh, those numbers. The cost estimates are, are set out by the finance secretary, and those are the cost estimates uh, that we stand uh, behind. And I've been very clear about that. Our focus now is on ensuring that these ferries are completed in the interests of our island communities and also on ensuring that Ferguson Shipyard and all those who work in it have a bright future. Uh, we will learn the lessons uh, from this. I've said uh, several times today I deeply regret uh, the experience uh, of this and I'm standing here and taking, as I did last week, full responsibility for that. Uh, but my focus, the government's focus, is on learning the lessons and securing the future of that shipyard. Thank you. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. President Officer, the waste of public money, a quarter of a billion pounds so far by the Government at Ferguson's, does not end with the award of the ferry contract. In August 2019, Tim Hare was appointed as Turnaround Director at the Yard. These emails, obtained through Freedom Information Show, the appointment was rushed through without the usual competition in just a few days. Mr Hare was selected from a short list of only three people all recommended by corporate advisers PricewaterhouseCoopers. In the process of negotiating his salary, he started by offering a rate of £2,000 a day, but ended up being paid just under £3,000 per expenses and expenses per day. And these emails also show the First Minister was informed about all of this and didn't raise a single objection. As people across Scotland tighten their belts, can the First Minister explain why she thought it was right to pay Tim Hare over £2 million meaning he earned in just 11 days what the average Scot earns in a year. First Minister. These decisions uh, were taken at uh, the time in line uh, with proper processes and procedures uh, and people paying uh, the market rates. I don't set the market rates for what uh, people are paid. Uh, but we will continue to focus. Uh, there is a new Chief Executive now in place uh, at Ferguson's. Um, has updated this Parliament uh, on the revised uh, timescales and the revised costs uh, for uh, the ferries, uh, and we will continue to update Parliament, uh, and Parliament will continue to hold the government um, and uh, the company, which of course is now in government ownership, to account. Uh, we will concentrate on learning the lessons, but more than anything, we will concentrate on completing the ferries, and we will concentrate on securing uh, a good future for that shipyard, uh, which of course is something that the STUC has already said said is of huge significance and that the government was right to intervene uh, to secure the future of the shipyard. Anna Sarwa. Market rate, £3,000 a day. Were you signing Lionel Messi? I mean, let's... Who is the First Minister kidding? I don't hear any apology or any regret for paying this man £2 million. Let's not forget that £2 million was to turn around the yard but the ferries still aren't delivered, are costing more and are delayed again. And this email, also found from Freedom of Information Requests, shows that government advisers actually suggested Tim Hare needed a decent pay package so that life wasn't, and I quote, unnecessarily painful for him while he swapped Hampshire for Port Glasgow. Shocking and out of touch. Families right now are having to count every penny. At the same time, Tim here says, and it seems the First Minister is suggesting, that he was value for money. Does the First Minister honestly think he's been value for money? And if not, what is she going to do to recover £2 million of taxpayers' money? First Minister. Make clear, I don't think the experience of this contract has been acceptable in any way, shape or form. Uh, but the focus now, uh, under the new Chief Executive of the Shipyard, is to get the ferries completed in the interests of island communities um, and to secure the future of the shipyard. That's what the Government is going to focus on. Uh, we continue uh, to focus on, and that is in the interest not just of island communities, but that is in the interest uh, of those who work in that shipyard. Uh, because we should not uh, lose sight of the fact that, but for uh, Government intervention, this shipyard would no longer 
longer be operational, it would no longer uh, be open and there would be nobody uh, employed. Right now we have more than 400 people employed in that shipyard and we intend to do everything we can to ensure that it has a bright future, which I think is what people in Port Glasgow and across Scotland will want to see. Anna Sarwa. Officer, we are all for protecting the jobs, but let's be clear, this was a PR stunt to protect Nicola Sturgeon's job, Derek Mackay's job and SNP MP's jobs. Because while people see their bills going up, they see a government paying a quarter of a billion pounds and still no ferries. Contracts and jobs going abroad and two million pounds paid to one person. This government and this First Minister is all about spin and PR while the public pay the bill. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon normal and done by the book, but Audit Scotland say the opposite. She says she's open and transparent, but Audit Scotland don't agree. Nicola Sturgeon says she, the delays are unacceptable, but then accepts the delays. She says she wants to learn lessons, but doesn't want a public inquiry. She says the government takes responsibility, but not a single person has. Why does she think it's acceptable that while people need help with the cost of living, they're instead paying the cost of her government's failure? First Minister. I, I don't think Anna Sarwar really uh, does support the protection and the retention of employment, because if we had followed uh, what he has just set out, there would be no Ferguson shipyard and there would be nobody employed in that shipyard. You know, from the point of public ownership uh, to November uh, 2020, the number of permanent jobs at Ferguson Marine uh, more than doubled. It has been sustained at a level over 350 uh, permanent staff uh, since then. Uh, there are currently around 400 permanent employees um, and additional agency workers. Uh, there have been 42 apprentices uh, learning a trade in that yard since August 2021, and the yard has plans to take on more apprentices later this year. Uh, more than 70% of all the people employed live in Inverclyde. Uh, so these are people employed right now that would be finding the cost of living crisis much harder uh, had the government not saved the shipyard. Uh, that's the reality. The contract and the experience of that is deeply regrettable. What is not regrettable is saving the shipyard and those who work in it, the jobs of those who work in it. Thank you. We'll now move to supplementary questions, and I call Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In my constituency around the Dreadcorn and Redford Barracks, there are many MOD family homes that have been left empty for many years. I wrote recently to the Tory Defence Secretary to highlight this issue again. Will the First Minister support my calls for the UK Government to consider the use of hundreds of empty MOD homes in Edinburgh and across Scotland to be used to house people being displaced as a result of Russia's war in Ukraine? First Minister. Uh, the humanitarian uh, crisis here and the scale of it means that it is important that all housing options are fully explored. So, uh, yes, I think that MOD housing uh, should be, must be considered as part of this process. I would uh, therefore welcome the UK Government, uh, which of course has sole responsibility for MOD property, making empty homes available to support uh, displaced people from Ukraine. Uh, the Scottish Government is already bringing together key partners to ensure effective coordination of plans to address the accommodation needs of people who are settling in Scotland. So we are committed to working with all partners to ensure all arrangements in place are safe, sustainable and offer true sanctuary for those fleeing the war. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that the war in Ukraine is having an impact on agricultural commodities closely linked to global gas prices. Borders farmers are facing rising costs for inputs, including manufactured fertiliser. The UK Government has announced steps to assist farmers to ad help address that uncertainty amongst growers and keep the costs down for farmers. We haven't heard anything yet from the SNP Government. So what action is your Government taking to support farmers at this very challenging time? First Minister. Continue uh, to work with farmers uh, to give whatever support we can, but I think it's important to point out that while uh, the impact of the war in Ukraine uh, is obviously being felt on our farming community, uh, that is a community that is also and was already suffering the impacts of Brexit. So actually, in many respects here, the real responsibility actually does lie with the UK Government. Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
to ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that international students are not subject to racial profiling when trying to access accommodation in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, nobody, uh, students uh, nor anybody else, should be subject to racial profiling, and uh, we would take a very dim view of any evidence that that was happening. I'd be very happy uh, to hear uh, more uh, of the, the information, perhaps, that lies behind the question, um, and look into it if that is necessary, and consider what action may be necessary as a result of that. Alistair Allen. Um, the First Minister is, I know, aware of the extreme impact of fuel poverty in the Western Isles, um, where 88 per cent of households are not connected to the gas grid. While electricity prices will rise sharply across the whole of Scotland from tomorrow, the price of heating oil has already more than doubled since uh, this time last year, and there is little to no competition uh, within my own constituency, leaving consumers without any choice of supplier. Can the First Minister give an assurance that the Scottish Government will continue to make representations to the UK Government to urge them to introduce proper regulation and price caps for the heating oil industry? First Minister. Uh, yes, I can assure Alistair Allen that we will continue to make representations to the UK Government on what is a very important matter. Uh, this is an unregulated market and the powers to introduce regulation uh, do remain with the UK Government. Uh, however, the Scottish Government recognises the impact of price increases on off-gas grid uh, energy consumers and I am very aware of the severe impacts that fuel poverty has in rural and island communities. Uh, we have confirmed that we will continue our fuel insecurity funding to support those struggling with bills uh, regardless of what fuel they use and we will also continue providing assistance for households to move away from dependence on heating oil where a low carbon alternative is available. Sue Weber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, this week we saw the publication of another deeply troubling set of cancer statistics. They revealed that less than 80 per cent of urgent referrals are being treated within the two months uh, target, shamefully short of the target set by this SNP Government. And yet this is not something for which the SNP Government can use the pandemic as justification. This target has now not been met for almost a decade and is the worst performance since 2008. For all the time, this target remains unmet. Patients and their families are left in limbo. So, First Minister, what steps will you urgently take to restore 10 years of missed targets? First Minister. Uh, on the issue of cancer waiting times, which is uh, extremely important, there are, uh, as the member will be aware, two key targets. The 31-day target, we actually uh, exceed uh, that target on the 62 uh, the urgent suspicion of cancer referral uh, to treatment target, uh, while in percentage terms that target is not being met at the moment, uh, we are working hard to do that, there are actually more people uh, being seen uh, within that target than was the case uh, a year ago and uh, two years ago. We have announced additional funding, £10 million of additional funding in this year, a further £10 million uh, in the coming financial year, uh, which have a particularly strong focus on colorectal and urology, which are two of the pathways that are uh, having most challenges in terms of waiting times. The initiatives that that funding is supporting include upskilling nurses, investing in diagnostic tests, for example. Uh, we have also established three pilot early cancer diagnostic centres and continue to invest in our Detect Cancer Early programme. Uh, so there is a range of initiatives backed by funding underway uh, as we seek to ensure uh, that we shorten, uh, in particular, the waiting time under the 62 day target. It is important to point out that the median wait under that target is 46 days, so uh, the median uh, obviously well within that. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. This week, the RCN reported record vacancies in nursing in Glasgow and that spending on bank and agency nurses has risen to £76.5 million. Pounds. This is unsustainable and unacceptable. It means delays and a lack of continuity for, of care for patients, increased pressure on existing staff and more strain on an already extremely tight budget. Can the First Minister say what new actions the government will take to address this crisis urgently because current plans aren't working? First Minister. Uh, I know the Health Secretary also met with the RCN yesterday. We have a range of initiatives in place. I have spoken about these in the Chamber, as has the Health Secretary, in recent weeks to support recruitment in our NHS, uh, which is uh, very, very challenged at the moment for a variety of reasons that members are well aware of. Uh, overall, uh, though, in Scotland right now, and um, this uh, excludes vacancies, obviously, uh, 
nursing and midwifery staffing is at a record high. It has increased by 14.5% uh, uh, since this government took office. NHS staffing overall has uh, increased by more than 20% to a record high uh, since this government took office. Uh, so we have record numbers working in our NHS right now, but we want to recruit more. We have targets to recruit more, and that's why we're investing uh, heavily working with NHS boards uh, on targeted initiatives to make sure uh, that that recruitment is successful. Question number three, Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what changes the recent shifts in fossil fuel prices and the need for energy security have made to its plans for decarbonisation. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government takes a comprehensive uh, approach to meeting our net zero targets. Uh, our draft energy strategy and just transition plan will consider technologies to transform Scotland's energy system. Through our heat in buildings programmes, we are driving decarbonisation of homes and buildings and have enhanced support and advice schemes as part of the £1.8 billion investment in this Parliament. Uh, and the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero and Energy recently wrote to the UK Government outlining Scotland's proposals for decarbonisation, including accelerating the electricity network, increasing financial resources for renewables and resolving unfair network charges that are not aligned with Net Zero. Maggie Chapman. I thank the First Minister for that response. There is urgent need for action. People are facing a cost of living crisis now. Energy bills are going up from tomorrow. All this while the UK Government seems determined to abandon climate commitments and increase the growing profits of oil and gas companies. A crisis of this nature needs a concerted, holistic response. We must deliver, at scale, measures to help those most in need. We must insulate Scotland, retrofit buildings, invest in low-carbon heating and grow our renewables potential. Can the First Minister outline what the Scottish Government is doing now to supercharge renewables and energy, efficient, energy efficiency programmes? What plans are in place to ensure the necessary workforce and skills are in place? And finally, does she agree that the oil and gas companies should not be profiting from the cost of living crisis? First Minister. Well, we believe and have set out uh, ways in which the UK Government uh, should be doing more to help people right now with the cost of living crisis. We're taking a number of actions ourselves, but the levers and resources in the main uh, lie with the UK uh, Government. Um, and we also believe that this is a time to try to accelerate uh, the transition to net zero, not in any way to move uh, off that ambition. Uh, as I said uh, in my earlier answer, we have extensive plans in place across the energy sector to meet these targets. This includes, for example, investing £100 million in the hydrogen sector, uh, boosting support for households to improve their own energy efficiency and to transition away from fossil fuel heating. Uh, we have our Green Jobs Workforce Academy supporting existing employees to undertake necessary upskilling and reskilling to secure green job opportunities. Uh, we have also called on the UK Government for an extended windfall tax on organisations, including oil and gas companies, that are making significant profits uh, right now. And of course, our most recent budget sets out record levels of investment to address the climate emergency and deliver a just transition to net zero. Fergus Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister welcome the 11% reduction in emissions from North Sea operations achieved? And does she agree that more gas produced here? in the UKCS means less imported LNG, cutting emissions by nearly 300 per cent. Should we in Scotland not be in the lead on decarbonising opportunities, offshore wind to power platforms, hydrogen technology and carbon capture and storage, which the Climate Change Panel say is vital to get to net zero? And does she recognise in conclusion that without a thriving oil and gas sector, Scotland may simply lose these major opportunities to lead on net zero because it is their skills, their technical expertise and their operational experience that are essential to deliver them. First Minister. I certainly welcome uh, the efforts of the oil and gas sector to decarbonise uh, their own activities. I think that's something we should uh, all welcome. Of course, we have to also think about the impact on the environment of the use of oil and gas. That's uh, an important part of getting to net zero as well. I do agree and uh, have made uh, clear my agreement 
uh, that the skills, the expertise and indeed the infrastructure of the oil and gas sector uh, will be extremely important in making sure that we make that transition uh, to renewable and low carbon sources of energy. Um, we need to make that transition as quickly uh, as possible for a, a variety of reasons and the importance of that has been underlined in recent weeks but we need to do that uh, fairly and justly as well. And, uh, when he uh, was a minister uh, with these responsibilities, Fergus Ewing played a really important role in helping ensure that the government is on uh, the right track. Uh, nobody wants to increase dependence on imports of oil and gas, uh, but we must therefore ensure uh, that we are investing properly in the transition to renewables, and that is what this government is seeking to do. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you just said nobody wants to increase dependency on imports, but reports this week suggest that without political backing, the UK could be wholly dependent on imports of oil and gas within 15 years due to a lack of confidence to invest. Now, given the Campbell Field is priced in to the Climate Change Committee's net zero projections for decarbonisation, could help reduce the cost of energy bills and create around 4,000 jobs, and would significantly help the UK's energy security, will the First Minister consider, consider giving her political backing to production from Campbell? First Minister. I, I've made clear my views on Campbell. I think they are uh, well known and well reported. Uh, I'm not the decision maker uh, on Campbell, but I've made uh, my views uh, clear on that. Um, I think everybody accepts, uh, even uh, the members, uh, colleagues in the UK government, accepts the importance of moving away from reliance on fossil fuels as, as quickly as possible, but that we need to do that uh, justly. The question is how we best do that. And of course, a significant proportion of what is produced in the North Sea right now is actually exported uh, right now. Uh, we need to invest more in renewables and low carbon sources of energy. As Fergus Ewan rightly has said, we need to invest in carbon capture and storage. Uh, and it is again regrettable that the UK government has not prioritised uh, the Scottish cluster, the ACORN project uh, there. Uh, this is inescapable and the war in Ukraine has just reminded us of how important it is to transition away from fossil fuels. Uh, there will be different of opinion about how best to do that, uh, but it is inescapable that we do that, and for this government, the investment in and support of renewables is a crucial part of it. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government anticipates the impact will be of the register of persons holding a controlled interest in land, which will launch on 1, 1 April. First Minister. This new public register will increase transparency around uh, land management and ownership. It will be held by Registers of Scotland and free to access. It will provide information about those who ultimately make decisions about the management or use of land, even if they are not uh, registered as the owner. Uh, so, in short, it will mean uh, those who are in control of the land, who are taking the decisions about the use of the land, uh, are not able to effectively hide their identities because they are not the registered owner. Um, it will include overseas entities and trusts, irrespective of when the land was acquired, and the information will enable individuals and communities to identify and engage with those who make decisions about land that affect them. So it marks a significant milestone in making land ownership in Scotland more transparent, which of course is a key objective for the Scottish Government's land reform ambitions. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, President. Officer. I thank the First Minister for her answer and welcome this legislation. To put this in practical terms, the First Minister will be aware in many small towns, such as Gallifields in my constituency, the town centres are blighted by many long-term vacant large retail outlets, but the actual owners or landlords cannot be traced, preventing organisations such as Energised Gallifields and indeed the local authority redeveloping the town centre either through voluntary or indeed compulsory purchase. Is this the type of difficulty the legislation will at long last help resolve? First Minister. That is certainly uh, one of the issues uh, that this register will help to resolve. As I said earlier on, uh, the main purpose of it is to improve transparency. Uh, so that the public have information who, about people who are actually making the decisions uh, about use of land, uh, wherever that land is, uh, regardless of who actually owns or who is the registered owner uh, of it. Uh, so anyone, including local authorities, who want to contact uh, the person who controls or influences these decisions will be able to use the register to find the contact details uh, where they are on the register. So I think this uh, will make it easier for communities to find and contact those who control land and property and then influence the decisions about the land and property that impact on them or their communities. 
Question number five, Graham Simpson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what immediate improvements the Scottish Government plans to deliver for passengers when it takes control of ScotRail on the 1st of April. First Minister. Well, the transition of ScotRail passenger services into public ownership uh, tomorrow will be a very significant milestone. It will also fulfil a manifesto commitment of this Government and mark a new beginning for ScotRail. It provides an opportunity to modernise and deliver passenger services which are efficient, sustainable, safe, fit for the future and which reflect the changing world we live in. Uh, obviously, from tomorrow, services will continue as normal. It is important that we provide reassurance and familiarity to passengers in the immediate term as we recover from the disruption and impact of the pandemic. Uh, later this spring, we will launch a national conversation offering rail staff, passengers and communities an opportunity to contribute to the future vision for Scotland Railway and help shape uh, this new beginning for ScotRail. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Well, we know the SNP is no good at running things. You just have to look at the ferries for that. So given that fiasco, rail passengers should be worried that NatRail will turn out to be Calmac on wheels. On Sunday, Transport Minister Jenny Gilruth was quoted as saying, from day one, you might not necessarily see anything that looks different, but the major difference is accountability. Well, Miss Gilruth obviously didn't get the memo that this government doesn't do accountability. So far, what we do know is that we're going to have, can we, can rising, we have your question, fares, please? rising fares, service cuts and ticket office closures. What part of that is an improvement? First Minister. Well, this government, of course, has uh, already delivered significant improvements on our railways, and that's even before uh, the railway comes into public ownership, as it will tomorrow. And I know uh, the Conservatives uh, like being reminded of this, so I'm going to uh, deliver again uh, on this. So, since 2009, under this government, the communities of Alloa, Lawrence Kirk, Armadale, Blackridge, Calder Crooks, Conan Bridge, Shawfair, Esk Bank, Newton Grange, uh, Gorebridge, Stow, Gala Shields, Tweed Bank and Kintore, all reconnected to the rail network uh, through the reversal of cuts. In the next three years, Reston, East Linton, Dalcross, Cameron Bridge and Leaven will follow. Uh, railway workers in England under the Tories faced a pay freeze. Fair pay deal was delivered in October last year for ScotRail staff. Um, and lastly, of course, we have taken action to keep rail fares down. ScotRail fares are on average 20 per cent cheaper than in those areas of the UK governed by the Conservatives. John Mason. Hey, the public ownership of ScotRail is very, very welcome, both to all reasonable members in this place and to the public at large. Does the First Minister think that this will increase opportunities for the railway and it will better serve Scotland's people and economy? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. I think bringing ScotRail into public ownership and control is a historic moment and I am delighted that it is happening under this government. Uh, but many others, including the rail unions, campaign for this to happen and I think it is important to pay tribute to them as well. Um, our commitment is clear. We have invested £9 billion in the railway since 2007. I have just listed the stations that have been reconnected since 2009, with five more uh, to follow. Uh, of course, we have delivered a pay deal uh, for staff, uh, in contrast, a pay freeze south of the border. And of course, we will continue to press for full devolution of rail powers, uh, including full devolution of network rail in Scotland, so that we can then truly deliver the railway that Scotland wants and deserves. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update on what the £10 million Long Covid support fund has been allocated for and how much has been spent. First Minister. Uh, services and support are already being provided across Scotland for those with long COVID. Uh, we know more is needed, not just now, but also for the long term uh, to support people in the most appropriate way. Our long COVID strategic network brings together clinical experts, NHS boards and those with lived experience and will determine how we target the support fund at the areas where additional resources needed and can make the biggest difference in the long term. Uh, and the first tranche of funding will be allocated over uh, the coming uh, weeks, the next few weeks. Uh, this will be used by boards to strengthen the coordination of services across supported self-management, primary care, rehabilitation support and secondary care investigation and support. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for 
for her response, but long COVID sufferers described there being very few services in place. Now, this funding was announced in September 2021. No indication was given at that stage that it would be six months later, and not one penny of money has been allocated to health boards to develop services. Instead, as we've heard, the money is going to be spread over the next three years, with numbers of those suffering from long COVID estimated by the ONS to be 119,000 and rising. Why has the pace been so slow? Can the First Minister indicate when every health board in Scotland will have dedicated long COVID services to help patients and their GPs? First Minister. Well, firstly, we set up, um, as I indicated in my initial answer, uh, the long COVID uh, strategic network. Uh, that was deliberately so that uh, the targeting of this uh, funding would be driven and determined by clinical experts on the front line and by those with lived experience of long COVID. But of course, uh, in addition to that, we've also already launched a long COVID information platform to help people manage symptoms. Um, we have done work uh, to raise awareness of long COVID and signpost people to appropriate support. NHS Scotland is already delivering care in line with the recommendations of the clinical guidelines uh, developed by uh, NICE, uh, for example. Um, and of course, this is underpinned in Scotland already by the full range of NHS services. That includes primary care teams, community-based rehab services, uh, with referrals to secondary care where uh, necessary. Uh, long COVID clinics are one model that NHS boards may consider already, but no one single approach is going to fit all areas and circumstances. So we will uh, continue to support the development of multidisciplinary support services, because this is something that will be required for the long term. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Long COVID is becoming the biggest mass disabling event since World War I. Nearly 120,000 sufferers, they need clinics, care pathways, long COVID nurses, but we are still nowhere. I have asked the First Minister about this every month since the funding was announced in September, and she said that an action plan was being implemented. Six months on, and we've just learned that not one penny has left the Scottish Government bank account of that £10 million. So can I ask the First Minister if she will now apologise to Scotland's long COVID sufferers, if she will wake up her ministers on this issue and get help Help to suffer as fast. First Minister. Uh, no, I won't, because we continue to support the development of uh, services uh, that uh, are appropriate for those who will need this support, not just now, but in the long term. And uh, this has already been underpinned by the full range of uh, NHS support services. I've outlined the work that has already been done, and I've outlined uh, why we took the decision to allow clinical experts and those uh, who are living with long COVID to direct the nature uh, of the funding that is being made available. Uh, I've been encouraged in this chamber uh, to follow the example uh, allegedly that is being taken south of the border. There was a report published uh, just last week, I think, by the all-party parliamentary group on COVID there, uh, stating uh, that the pathways established by the UK government, including long COVID clinics, uh, do not meet uh, the demand, um, and that some of these clinics may be experiencing temporary or even permanent closures. The reason we are doing it in the way that we are is so that we are not uh, somehow suggesting there is one single model. Uh, this is support that needs to be delivered across the entirety of the NHS. And of course, we still need to understand more about the nature of long COVID, which is why the Chief Scientist Office is also funding right now nine Scottish-led research project projects in order that we can continue to develop our understanding and ensure that services develop alongside that. Question number seven, Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what immediate safeguarding measures will be in place to ensure that arrivals from Ukraine are protected from organised criminal activity, human trafficking and exploitation. First Minister. Any form of human trafficking or exploitation is abhorrent. People must be protected from it. Uh, Police Scotland's National Human Trafficking Unit continues to engage with uh, internal and external partners and enforcement agencies 
to maintain a very high visibility of human trafficking and exploitation risks at points of entry around Scotland. And anyone with concerns about human trafficking should contact Police Scotland. In terms of safeguarding where people are opening their homes to displace people from Ukraine, hosts can apply for expedited disclosure checks of the same level of scrutiny as the initial checks carried out for those working with children and vulnerable adults. This is under the new regulations introduced last week to ensure that we have in place a safe, speedy and free vetting system. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the First Minister? I think we all thank the huge number of Scottish families who have come forward to open their homes to the uh, Ukrainians who are coming here through the UK-wide scheme. But I think we also have to be realistic that sadly not everyone who offers help will be well-intentioned. In fact, uh, organised criminal gangs may see what is happening in Ukraine as more of an opportunity than a tragedy. A number of uh, uh, very uh, important organisations, including Tara, Survivors of Human Trafficking in Scotland and Scotland Against Modern Slavery, have always quite valid concerns about the vulnerability and desperation of those arriving and the real potential for harm posed by luring arrivals into low-paid, illegally uh, or sexually exploitative activities or even worse, simply being abused in private homes. So can I ask the First Minister, first of all, what work will be undertaken by the government and its public agencies to adequately vet, prepare, but also educate host families before the arrival uh, of those coming to Scotland. But after they have arrived and settled, what ongoing safeguards will be in place in the medium to long term to ensure that we are tracking, tracing and monitoring both the well-being and the safety of those who have resettled in Scotland to make sure that none of them, absolutely none of them, are being exploited in any way whatsoever? First Minister. No. This is a really important issue and we are designing and have been designing support services uh, that make sure appropriate uh, safeguarding is in place but also that we take account and uh, the partners we are working with can take account of the ongoing well-being needs of those who, who come to Scotland. So disclosure checks are an important part of this, but having that multi-agency approach to make sure that people get the support they need, not just on arrival and when they're first being accommodated, uh, but throughout the time that they may be in Scotland. Uh, the, one of the reasons for uh, us agreeing the super sponsor uh, route with the UK government is so that we could have uh, an approach that gets people to Scotland quickly, then uh, temporarily accommodates them, uh, while in slightly, and I stress slightly slower time, uh, we put in place all of the wider support and do all of the appropriate checks. Uh, so we have support arrangements already in place, uh, starting with the welcome hubs that have been established. Um, the, the big hold-up at the moment, and I, I say this, we are working constructively with the UK Government to try to, to resolve this. I met with Michael Gove uh, earlier this week on this particular issue. We've got the super sponsor route. Um, we have the support in place. Uh, we are being held up at the moment uh, by the slow pace of the granting of visas. And that is what I know the UK Government is seeking to speed up. Uh, I hope that happens quickly so that we can start to welcome significant numbers of people to Scotland with all of the support that Jamie Green uh, rightly identifies as being vital for them. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a brief pause before we move on to members' business.